Uh, want to make mention, we have uh, some guests with us. If you're a guest with us, we welcome you, of course, as always. We have a couple of special guests I'd like to mention, though. Uh, um, Mike and Brenda Cooper are here once again in the front row. Pastor Mike. Many of you know Pastor Mike is not a first time here at IBC, and so welcome back. It's good to see you. And they brought with them another couple as well. This couple is um, from the States, and they're here visiting with the Coopers. Uh, the, uh, pa Pastor uh, Adams is the last name, right? And D David? David and Tanya Adams are here with us. They're uh, the Coopers Ascending Church in the U.S., in Indiana, in the U.S., and so they're just here visiting, getting to uh, know all of you. Uh, I've known Tanya, his wife, a long time myself. Uh, we first uh, uh, had met when we were in junior high together in the States, when we were living in, uh, my parents were living in Missouri. And we were at the same church there for a year or two at least. And then again, we went to uh, Bible college at the same time as well later. So it's good to catch up and see you all again. I hope you enjoy your stay and that you get some sun while you're here. Uh, praise the Lord for that. Um, for today's uh, scripture text, I'd like to, I believe, invite Ryan. Are you here, Ryan? Come on up and give us the reading today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, church. Today I'll be reading from... Colossians 1, verse 9 to 14. So will you please stand with me as I read this passage? For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you walk, you walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful and good work, in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthen in all might according to his glorious power, with all patience and long suffering with joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Uh, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the, the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness, forgiveness of his sins. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate that. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Your word is, is uh, beautiful. It is powerful. It is life. We pray, Father, that we would take this passage, this word, and give us understanding, illumine our understanding, illumine our minds. Help us, Lord, to know how we are to live for you. Father, if there's anybody who is still not sure of their own salvation, their own standing with you as their creator, I pray that you would work in that person's heart, that your spirit would convict them and draw them to Jesus Christ who can save. Thank you, my Father, in Jesus' name. And we say, Amen. Amen. I love Paul's prison of the epistles. As we said last week, he was writing this uh, far away from home in a Roman prison. And this is one of uh, several prison epistles or letters that he has written. They're unique. And today, this text that we're looking at is a simple prayer from the apostle uh, to the church, to the church at Colossae. Uh, who do we believe was the founding uh, pastor uh, of the church in Colossae? Remember his name? Epaphras. And so he writes this, and he's heard from Epaphras what's going on in the church. And Paul, with his uh, apostle's heart and with his heart of love for believers and for this church, he writes to them encouragement. He writes to them some warnings, and, and he wants them to do well. He wants them to do well. The thing about his prison epistles that I find interesting is that he doesn't pray that God would release them. He doesn't pray for them to treat him better or for them to have better food. He always focused, his prayer is on spiritual blessings, not on the physical things. Now, there are times that he prays for physical things. There, we even see in the scriptures that Paul prayed for physical things as well. 
Uh, but for him, the spiritual health and well-being of the people, of the church, was far, far more important. And we'll see this in his prayer. In his prayer, he makes three requests. Let's look at the first request together. The first request is he prayed for their spiritual knowledge. He wants them to understand spiritual things. He looks at verse number 9. He says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He says, For this reason... Now, that leads us to think, what reason? What is he referring to? What is he talking about? It's referring to what he had already said, of course. And in verse 2, we see, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for the saints. He says, for this reason, because you're believers, because you've been genuinely born again, you belong to Jesus Christ. You're part of God's family now. And so he's reminding them. Now, remember... Uh, he's going to address some things in his letter, but there was some wrong teaching coming into the church from two different elements. The first element was the Judaizers trying to bring them back under law and focus on special days and, and, and different aspects of the, the Jewish law. But the second element was uh, different kind of pagan teachings, uh, focusing on experience, focusing on uh, angels, focusing on a special hidden knowledge or wisdom that others really didn't have. And so Paul begins by saying, for this reason. What reason? You belong to God. You are genuinely His. You are born-again believers, born-again Christians. Despite these issues that He's going to be dealing with, you belong to Him. Don't forget that. Know who you are. He says, for this reason, we pray for you, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. Every Christian needs to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Every Christian needs this. There's a couple of aspects of understanding God's will, a couple of categories, if you would. The first is simply his general will, general will. His general will. Um, This is not referring to a mystical, spiritual understanding that comes from your mind or that you get in a dream or a vision. Wisdom and understanding that Paul is talking about here comes from God. And God has given us the word of God so that we can understand it and find it. And so Paul's desire for them is that they know God's will. And first and foremost, we must know the word of God. And this is what God wants for mankind everywhere. God's general will is given for mankind. There are many, many things in God's word that are part of his general will. The entire word of God is God's general will written to us for mankind to know. A few of them, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Why does it say be based? It's baptized. So repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. That's God's will. We don't have to pray about this. We don't have to say, God, do you want me to be baptized? God, should I repent? God has given us his will. We see in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That you should abstain from sexual immorality. This is God's will for us, for his people. Sanctification, holiness, uh, free from sexual immorality. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, and everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So God's people are to be a thanksgiving, thanks-filled people. That's what we are. And over and over throughout the scriptures, we see God's general will to us. You want to know God's will for your life? Get into the word. Get into Bible study. Be faithful in church. Be faithful in your own devotional time with him. There are many, many things that we are to know. 
The trouble is many aren't wanting this. They are looking for something else. They want that other mysterious unknown will of God in their life. God wants you to know his will. He's not hiding it. But there's another aspect of God's will, and that is the specific will of God. A specific will of God. This is the areas perhaps specific to your life. Specific to our lives. And so we go to God and we say, God, should I go to this school or should I go to that school? God, should I take this job or that job? God, should I date this person or that person? Marry this person or that person? God, I want to know your specific will for my life. Um, right offhand, I just want to say, by the way, that I believe that there's many things that perhaps we focus a lot on that in God's estimation, we could do this or do that and still be in God's will. If we're walking with the Lord, if we're in His general will and we're in His word and we are following Him and obeying Him, you may choose to marry Sally, you may choose to marry, you know, Rhonda over here. Uh, both of them are believers who love the Lord. You could choose to become a plumber, you could choose to become a teacher, and you can serve God in God's will in either one of those choices. But the simple truth is this, the better a believer knows and understands the general will of God the more he will be able to discern a specific will of God. God, what do you want me to do in this situation? What would you have me to do? But put your focus and make sure that you're walking with God and you are understanding of his will for mankind in general, that you are in the word of God. Make that your focus, your desire. Paul's desire was for the Colossian Christians to be deeper in the word, in all wisdom. So while God has given you a mind to use, there are times when you need to make a decision and you want God to guide. I understand that. I have been there many times. So what I'm saying is he who has an understanding of God's general will through his revealed word is best able to discern, to, to discern his specific will. The second thing that he prayed for, that Paul prayed for the Colossian church, is this, uh, he prayed for their obedience. So we have understanding of God's will for mankind. What are you going to do with it? What do you do? It's not just enough to understand. He said in verse 10, that you may walk Worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. In the Christian life, our knowledge and obedience must go together. Knowledge and obedience must go together, and if it doesn't, there's a problem, and we need to address that problem. It was Jesus that said in John 14, if you love me, what? Keep my commands, commandments. Keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. In my ministry, I've met people that you could say kind of have become addicted to the understanding and studying the deeper truths of the word of God, yet somehow they never get around to applying it to themselves. And that's a shame. Be careful. That you don't just become so filled with knowledge and information. As James put it, be doers of God's word as well. There's two words to note in this part of the prayer. It's walk and it's work. He says that you may walk worthy, being fruitful in every good work. Walk and work. Unless I am walking in fellowship with God, I'm not able to produce work that is pleasing to God. 
I must be walking with the Lord. Elsewhere, Paul stated, Ephesians 4, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling by which you have been called. Walk worthy of it. You belong to Christ. You are a Christian. You are a child of God. And all the time, Paul says, remember this and walk worthy. This is not the same thing as as saying uh, walk and work uh, to be approved so that you may become a child of God. It's different. He says, you are God's child. Now walk worthy. I was reminded of this uh, concept uh, recently at Christmas time. I was given a gift uh, from family. The gift was a t-shirt. And on the t-shirt, it says, you wouldn't understand this. It's a young thing. Okay? Not as in old and young, but as in our name is young. You wouldn't understand because it's a young thing. Youngs understand this. Why? Because they're family. We're a family. And so we get certain things that other people may not get. That's the idea. It's just supposed to be cute. But, you know, in the past, I've desired for my children to walk worthy of their name. Walk worthy of being a young. You're a young. And what am I saying to them if I want them to walk worthy of who they are? I'm not saying that if, you're, if you do wrong that you're no longer going to be part of our family. I'm not saying I'm giving you a trial to see if you're going to become a young. I'm saying this is who you are. You're a young. Be proud of that. Uh, bring a good reputation to that fact, to that name. We belong to Christ. We are in Him. Let us walk worthy of that. If you belong to Christ, if you've been born again, walk worthy of it so that we bring a good reputation to the one who saved us. Understand? Then there's work. Be fruitful in every good work. What work? What is our work? God wants you uh, to walk with him, to walk worthy, and to be fruitful in every good work. What work is he talking about? Um, It's not just to be limited to those in proper ministry, those who teach Sunday school, who visit people or visit sick people or the preaching and teaching or any other one of our ministries, these are good and part of doing the work that we have to do, that God has for us. But our good work isn't just divided into two camps, spiritual and and flesh or secular carnal. It shouldn't be. What we do, all that we do, ought to be done in the spirit. When you leave here today and you go out tomorrow and into your work, into, well, I don't guess school tomorrow, but Tuesday, when you go back to schools, that's not just, well, that's out in the world, I'll wait to get spiritual and do my work when I come to church. God has given you a work to do. You being a good husband is spiritual work. Loving your wife as Christ loved the church, that is a spiritual work. Being a good wife is spiritual work. Honoring, loving, supporting your husband. Children. God has words for children too. And your obedience to your parents is spiritual service to the Lord. Your job for your employer is spiritual The Bible has a lot to say about the work that God has given to you to do and how you're to do it, how you're to view it, and how you worship God in it, you honor God in it. This is our work. And God says, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. I want you to walk with me and be fruitful in every good work. What is your goal in work? Paul writes in another letter, 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more 
just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and please God. What's your motive? What's my motive? I want to please God. I want to glorify God. I want to please the master. I want to honor him. The closer you walk with him, the more your heart's desire is to bring glory to him, to please him. The more you love him, the more you desire to bring joy to him. How was this work done in us? Well, Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, It is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God does that work inside of you. We submit, we yield, but ultimately we must remember God is the one who is at work. He who began that good work, he is faithful to continue till the day of Christ. He began that good work in you. And so the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence that we see of God in our life, is that work that God has been doing in us. And we submit to Him. We yield to Him. We walk with Him. So our understanding of God's will leads us to good works. God begins His work in us as we draw close to Him in faith. And I just want to ask, is God working in your life, Christian? Is your life consisting of good works to God in all areas, in all that you do, all that He has given to you. Our Christian life needs the right kind of balance, yes. We get to know God more by meditating on Him, drawing close to Him, but we cannot, must not stop with that. It leads us from isolated quietness to others-focused. Uh, there's a church down the road, and I drive by, and I see a sign, and I haven't yet quite figured out what it means, but it says, a place of solitude for everyone. That's on the outside of the church, a place of solitude for everyone. And so I'm trying to figure, you know, we all come together to be alone. There's a time to be alone. Yes, uh, there's that time of, like, Jesus modeled, and he went to be with the Father, but that's not what his whole life was about. And after that time, he would go and, and be about the work that God had given him to do. We need that. It was uh, preacher uh, D.L. Moody that once said, Every Bible should be bound in shoe leather. Every Bible should be bound in shoe leather. What was he saying? He was illustrating this very point. You take your Bible, but then you You move. You do it. You put it to work. You put it to action. You put your life into action in serving the Lord. What else did he pray for? He prayed for moral excellence. Verse 11. Again, in his prayer for the Colossians, he says, Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power for, uh, with all patience and long-suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. So we can have a lot of spiritual knowledge and lack Christian service. But if we lack godly character... It negates our Christian service. Godly character is what should set apart, it should be what defines a, a professing Christian. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But our lives should be shaped to look like our Father. You know, my kids were growing up, there were times when the people told them, You sure look a lot like your dad. You act a lot like your dad. Your laugh is similar to your dad. 
and sometimes mom. But why was that? Well, they were raised in my home. They're my children. And so they learn from their dad. They watch and they hear. Christians should look like our dad. Should talk like him. Begin sounding more and more like him all the time. In my uh, current ongoing uh, studies that I, I do, I'm writing and researching the importance of credibility in the Christian testimony. The importance of credibility in a Christian testimony. It's not enough to know the Romans road, know how to lead people through it and, and try to get them to pray. Our credibility is so vital to the world. Your credibility is so vital. When a, when a witness is giving testimony in a court, what is the one thing that the opposition will try to do? Or, or what's the one thing that the solicitors will try to establish? Credibility. Is the testimony credible? What they had to say might be very important. What they had to say might even be true. But if they can establish that the person giving it is not credible as a witness, then their testimony can be thrown out. Now God has called us to be witnesses. But I believe that too many a Christian have made themselves a reputation that isn't consistent. They have given, they have received a reputation of being easily deceived or gullible or even passing on hearsay and half-truths frequently. And when that person then goes on and says, listen to me, I have the greatest truth ever to mankind found in Jesus Christ, why would people believe them? One of the qualifications for an overseer, an episcopos, a bishop, or what we just call, you know, the pastor of a church. One of the qualifications is found in 1 Timothy 3, verse 7. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and into the snare of the devil. But this good testimony on those outside, what this is literally saying is he must have a good record or a good report with those who are outside the church. Why? Because we must have that credibility. Even Jesus, is his, his worst enemies, who were seeking to destroy him and crucify him, they couldn't bring any real charges and accusation against him because of his testimony, because of his credibility. Pilate comes out and he says, I find no fault with this man. And he wanted to. It would have been easier if he found something very easy, a clear problem, and says, well, he, he is a liar. I guess you can have him put him to death. But he says, I find no fault. What do you want me to do? This isn't just for pastors, though. It's mentioned for pastors because they need to, this is essential this is for believers. We must have credibility. One place I've seen an increase in believers losing credibility is on things like social media. Being quick to pass on rumors and gossip and just flat out false things because you happen to like it. Christians need to be known as people that are lovers of truth no matter what. I recall a time not long ago uh, where a family member of mine posted something online. It was a video clip of a former president of the U.S. saying something that was really quite terrible and quite shocking. And, and uh, it only took about 20 seconds to find out that that wasn't true. It was edited in such a way that it, he was actually saying the opposite of what they said. And so I write just a short private message saying, uh, you know, check this out. It appears that it was kind of edited to mean something he didn't mean. 
And I get responded with something similar to, well, thanks, but it sounds like something he could have said. Sounds like something he could have said. My friends, we got uh, ought to be people who uh, respect and love truth more than that so that we can have credibility with people outside. It doesn't matter if you agree with an idea, a sentiment, or a thought if what you're passing around is untrue. You're chipping away at your credibility as a child of God. And I would just encourage you in that area, in the area of your reputation online, your credibility even. How about focus, keep the things focused primarily on God and His Word and the truth of it. For it'd be better for people to think that you are just crazy, strange, and weird because you hold to the gospel message that Jesus Christ died and rose again from the grave than for these other things that are found to be false. If you're to be crazy, then be crazy because you trust and believe God's word. Notice again the sentence, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Now we tend to think of God's glorious power to do something great and magnificent, a daring feat, defeating Goliath. That kind of stuff. Raising the dead. Let's make it big, Paul. We're strengthened with all might according to the glorious power of Jesus Christ. How wonderful. But the emphasis here goes on. It's on character, patience, long-suffering, joyfulness, and thanksgiving. Patience. It's endurance when times are hard. When circumstances are difficult. Don't think of patience as complacency. Patience is that soldier that's fighting the battle on a battlefield and not giving up even though it's hard and times are difficult. But he endures. Long-suffering. Joy. Now, joy is different than just being happy. We can be happy. We can be joyful. We can be both. But it's different. Happiness is more about circumstances. There are just happy times. And we love happy times. But joy is that which we have in all circumstances. Where was Paul writing from? He's writing from prison. There are other prison epistles. And he focuses on joy. Philippians is one of them. He writes that from jail as well. And the whole focus of that is being joyful in all circumstances. And he's not just talking because he's living it. Acts 16, Paul is in prison. And he's in bad shape. He was beaten and he's in prison. And what is he doing? He's praising God and singing and giving thanks and sharing Jesus Christ. He's joyful. Is he happy? Probably not so much. But he has a joy in his heart because who he is. Thanksgiving. Christians should be less complainers, more thanksgivers. Now, let's just close this out. Verse 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. There's so much good stuff here. So much. This is a message on its own. It really is. But He delivered us. Or he rescued us from the power of darkness. Outside of Christ, we are in darkness. We are in bondage. We are slaves to sin. We are separated from God. And he's, deli- he's rescued us. And he conveyed us or moved us or translated us, exchanged us on to his kingdom. The kingdom of light. And we have that redemption through his blood. His sacrifice, redemption, that is, we've been bought, we've been paid for. The debt that was owing to us was, is paid for. And because of that, we have forgiveness, which is our greatest need. 
He's forgiven us. He's forgiven you. I'd like to invite you to stand, please. Paul prayed for our spiritual knowledge, for our obedience to that knowledge, and that we may live a life of excellence as credible witnesses of Jesus Christ and the gospel. I want to lead us in a prayer in just a moment. If there's anybody here, though, that is not sure of your own relationship with God, I urge you today to come talk to us. Talk to one of our, the pastors here, one of our teachers, our, our life group leaders. There are many. Talk to us. Share with us what's going on, what God is doing in your heart. Just say, I want to talk more about trusting Jesus Christ today. I invite you, brothers and sisters, to pray with me now, though. Lord, thank you for <clears throat> delivering us from darkness into your kingdom. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins that we have through Jesus Christ. As your child, Father, I commit myself today to being filled with the knowledge of your will through your word. I commit myself to obeying your word, not just filling my mind with more information. And I pray that you will work in me to produce that moral excellence that is so needed in this world for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For Christ's glory, I pray this. Amen.